Okay, uh, so suppose we start with somewhere really close to x. So I want this, uh, um, want to start from some x that is close to my x star with a distance no larger than the epsilon. So what this epsilon is, remember that previously we have this ball right here uh, with the radius r. But within this ball, I only know that the, the uh, Haitian is invertible, but I'm not sure if this could be small enough. But let's say that we just try to make it as small as possible uh, so that it's, it also satisfies this and uh, and this. Okay? So we know that both of them, all of them will, will be true once our x is really close to x star. So let's say this is what we really need. I want my epsilon to be uh, the minimum value of r, 1 over c1, c2 or some number that's less, less than one, either one, uh, the smallest one of them. Okay, so this, say I can put this to be 0.99 or something like that. The point is that I want the epsilon itself to be less than one. You see that written soon later in this slide. Okay, so now suppose we uh, we uh, we run our algorithm up to some point, uh, either we chose this x, uh, initial x to be in this ball, so this is the ball that we we set. It's the center that star with the radius epsilon. So this epsilon is potentially a lot smaller than the original, the previous ball we saw. Because it's the radius like this. So it will be smaller than r, smaller than this, and smaller than one. Okay. Um, so let's say we, we we either choose the initial point to be within that ball, or we can run some other algorithm like the gradient method to get closer close to this x star. So let's say that up to x, the k situation we get into this ball. Then let's say what happens after uh, we apply one more iteration of Newton's method. Okay, uh, so so let's say this is the new arrow, right? This is the new arrow. Let's say how it is related to the previous arrow. So um, we know that Newton's method uh, has this update rule that is xk plus one is equal to xk minus this. Right, so this part is this part here. So just re rewrite it in this way due to the Newton's method and minus x star. And now, um, so here is a, uh, I need to multiply this uh, xk, I need to multiply the hk and the hk inverse into in front of this x okay i need to multiply that in front of my x i didn't really change anything because the the uh, h and h inverse they will cancel up so there will be the oh sorry i should uh, i should modify the hk inverse first and then hk so as i said this is just uh, equal to identity so i modify this in front of xk so i didn't change anything but by doing that, I can see that um, similarly, I will multiply the same thing to this. Okay, so what I will get in the parentheses, uh, in the norm, is actually H K inverse uh, times H K times xk. I have another one with x star, so minus x star. Okay, so as you can see, these two will cancel, so it doesn't really matter. And uh, But this one also have this this term here, so I extract it out. I will just need to take out the gk. Okay, so that is actually the new one I will get, and that is exactly uh, what I need, what I, what I had on the second line. So this, oh, this thing here is just uh, this one. Okay, so that's how we got this. Just multiplying this and this. Uh, it's the same thing to this. So, so this two will actually cancel the term uh, in front of that. Okay, so that's how I get this. Remember that this, I have this matrix inverse of the Haitian multiplied to this whole thing. 
Okay, and then due to the uh, property of the matrix norm, remember that the matrix norm of a ma the matrix norm of Q is defined by the maximum of the Qx divided by x for any non-zero x. So in other words, the Qx is always less than or equal to the norm of Q times the norm of x for any x. Right? Because Q nor the norm of Q is the maximum value uh, that you can ever get as, as the ratio. So uh, you must have this. Or in other words, this is because the Qx. So this is because this is always bigger than or equal to any specific x. Right? And then you multiply the Q. You can multiply the, the, the norm of x on both sides, you get the second line. And that is the reasoning here. So I have this like my Q. This is my like my Q. And this is like my x. So the norm of the product is less than or equal to the norm of this Q matrix times the norm of this vector here. Okay, so the vector here, uh, actually I can rearrange this. I've just rearranged this. I uh, have the negative GK, so you put it here. I have the zero, you'll see the reason uh, soon later. And then I have this, uh, this one here. So I, um, actually I switched this to, that's why I have a negative negative of this right because these two are switched as this so i put negative sign there so that's how we got this so this second term is exactly the same here okay the reason why i need this is because this is like the gradient this zero is gradient f at x zero since x zero is a uh, minimizer right so this must be this and then gradient f of x that's green f of xk. That is the gk and minus the hk, which is the, we'll rewrite it as the Haitian, f at xk, and then x star minus xk. Okay. So what I have in the second norm here is just this. I remember this term as shown here. We we know that it will be less than or equal to this quantity. Okay, so this term will be less than or equal to C1 times the norm of xk minus x star. Okay, that's one. And uh, the other one is this. Right? Um, So remember that here, I said that the Haitian of that, uh, the inverse of the Haitian has a, will have a norm less than or equal to C2. So that's why this will be less than or equal to C2 since the XK is in that ball. So within that ball, I know that will be uh, less than or equal to C2. So previously we said that uh, we can only guarantee this when the, the x is inside this ball with radius r. But now we have uh, a smaller ball, so that means that everything will be still valid in over this ball with the radius r epsilon. So that's why we still have this and also this. So the last one there shows that this is less than or equal to c1. Okay, now I have the c1, c2, uh, and the because I chose this epsilon such that uh, it is so small so that the C1, C2 uh, is less than, uh, this 1 over C1, C2 is less than, uh, so epsilon is less than 1 over C1, C2. So that's why, uh, sorry, I should have, I don't have this square here. So here, because the x, k is in this ball, so the distance between xk and the x star will be less than epsilon, but this is less than 1 over c1, c2, or less than or equal to 1 over c1, c2. That's why if I keep one of those norms, I try to write it as the product of the same thing, and the one of them will times this will be less than 1. So that's why I only have that one left. 
So that's why it should be in here. So it should be here. Okay, so it would be less than this. And then we know that uh, this is less than epsilon. So what I showed us so far is that if we or XK uh, got into this ball, then the XK plus one will be still in that ball. Okay, and uh, we just keep running and they will be always in that ball, always close. Um, so that's the first conclusion we'll get. The second conclusion is that uh, this one will be less than or equal to this. Okay, that's what we showed it as a middle step. It's a middle step, so that's why this is always uh, uh, this will be less than that. And see, this is the the convergence order two that we wanted in the first place. The next arrow is less than or equal to the square of the previous arrow. Okay, times some constant, but this is on the O of x k minus x star squared. Okay, x k and x star squared. Okay, so that's that means this is the convergence of order two. Okay, now we consider several uh, issues related to Newton's method and how we solve them. So uh, remember that the first issue with Newton's method is that uh, the direction d, which is the negative h inverse times g, uh, for Newton's method may not be a decent direction, uh, which means we go along this direction, uh, which is we go along this direction by following the Newton's method um, the function value may not be decreasing okay so <clears throat> remember that the, the issue comes with this uh, uh, search direction d so we denote this d here and remember that if this d is, uh, if this h is a positive definite, then we don't need to worry about that, um, because in that case, the d must be a decent direction. So let's see why this is true. Okay, <clears throat> so this is Newton's um, uh, direction. Remember that uh, if the g, if the g is non-zero, means that we have not reached the the critical point yet, and uh, the Hessian matrix H is positively definite, then this dk is guaranteed to be a decent direction. Okay? So the question related to that this is not a necessarily decent direction will not happen in this case. <coughs> okay. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, if you can if you can guarantee you can make sure that uh, if we can make sure that the H is a positive definite matrix, then the Newton's method, at least in this step, must be giving us a decent direction. And the reason for that is uh, if D, so this is D, if you call uh, our search direction is this. And then uh, let's do the same thing as before. We define the line search function, phi of alpha, where alpha is just step size. Then the phi of alpha is defined in this way. Okay? And then we remember that when alpha equals zero, then we're just uh, set this to zero and that's just uh, f of xk and uh, when we take the derivative and set to zero we know that it's this right this is what we have done several times before and, uh, the derivative of phi at zero is this quantity here remember that this is just gk so that's just gk that we have and uh, the dk here is the negative h inverse gk for Newton's method. So when I plug that in, I will get this part, the negative. So as you can see, um, if the H matrix is positive definite, then the H inverse is also positive definite. The eigenvalues are all positive. So the negative G H inverse G will be negative, right? Because this is a negative def uh, positive definite matrix. So this thing will be positive. Uh, for non-zero z, for non-zero g, and so that whole thing will be negative, and that means the at the point alpha equals at the point alpha equals zero, the derivative of phi will be zero. So what we can show is that 
if this is the alpha, this is zero, and if we try to plot the g phi of alpha, then this will be phi of zero, and the delta f here is negative. It means that it good is going down. So that that means for alpha small enough, say uh, when alpha is there exists some alpha bar, so that for alpha uh, less than alpha bar, this function will be decreasing. So eventually it may increase, but at least there exists some alpha bar such that it is uh, negative here. Uh, the the dart is negative here, and the function is decreasing over there. Okay, so that means along this direction d, uh, we can actually decrease our function value, at least for a step size not large enough. That's officially small step size. Okay, so that in that case dk must be uh, a decent direction. So again, what the theorem says that if we if you worry about that this d uh, may not be a decent direction, then at least uh, if you can guarantee this h k is positive definite, then you don't need to worry about this issue because uh, uh, at that point the dk must be a decent direction. But it still happens, but it is still possible that this HK is not, pos uh, not positive, definite. And in that case, uh, we cannot guarantee that the DK is a decent direction. Okay, so this is the, the second issue we just mentioned. Uh, if HK is positive definite, then we don't need to worry about the decent direction, D. The D must be a decent direction, but if it's not, um, in this case, the HK may have negative function, negative eigenvalues, and the, uh, it's also possible that the HK has zero eigenvalues. In that case, HK is uh, is degenerate. Right? In that case, HK is not even invertible. So we will not even have this have this form, or we we, do, we cannot even compute this. Okay, what do we do with that? Remember that. Uh, since H is a symmetric matrix, since H is a Haitian, right? If the second order derivative of F is continuous, then the Haitian matrix will be symmetric. So at least we know it's symmetric. It does not necessarily have all the eigenvalues positive. Well, as long as it's symmetric, we know that there will be an eigenvalue decomposition of this function H, uh, this matrix H. So this H, uh, for any symmetric matrix H, we can get an eigenvalue decomposition of that. And this means that we can find a orthogonal orthonorm, uh, orthonorm matrix U and the uh, and the uh, diagonal matrix lambda. So I should say orthonorm orthonorm matrix U means that the U transpose U is identity, or in other word, the U transpose is the inverse of U. Okay, uh, so we know that it's eigenvalue decomposition of H. And the, the diagonal matrix lambda here uh, is collects all the eigenvalues of H. Okay? And I suppose that we list them in the descending order. So we start from the largest one and uh, goes down to the smallest one. Okay, so as long as the matrix is symmetric, we know this eigenvalue decomposition exists and all the eigenvalues are past are real numbers. And then you will list them in this way, then the smallest number here. In case it is negative, we can try to add up a uh, diagonal matrix, uh, add up a uh, identity matrix, such that uh, H plus this identity matrix times some number mu uh, makes the whole thing positive definite. So what I'm trying to say here is that suppose we have this H equals to U lambda, U transpose lambda U, and this u lambda is just lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n. And the, what we're worrying about right now is that the sum of the, the lambda are negative. And uh, say, since we list them in descending order, so the most negative one, or the smallest one among them, is this last one. Then if I can add up, if I can add this, uh, some mu matrix, some mu times identity means that I have a diagonal matrix with the mu's on the diagonal, then this is my mu i. And apparently this is also equal to mu times u transpose 
I uh, U transpose uh, U. The reason is here you have the identity and the uh, U transpose U is, is itself equal to the identity. So this is just equal to this is just the identity here. Okay. And you can see I can move this mu inside as well. It's U transpose mu I U. Okay, so suppose we can we make this uh, we set this mu to be bigger than uh, the smallest eigenvalue of lambda n. So let's say I set mu to be this, meaning that the uh, lambda lambda n plus mu would be positive number. Okay, uh, so what I'm writing here is that if the smallest eigenvalue is positive. Then the negative of this second value will be zero. Uh, will be negative value, and the mean, uh, I should say, uh, I should say maximum of this. Okay, so my point here is that this should be maximum. Let me write. So my point here is that if lambda n is positive, then no, we don't need to do anything. Right. If lambda n is already positive, that means the h is already positive definite matrix. We don't need to do anything. We just uh, the h itself is already positive definite. If the lambda n is negative, say lambda n equals negative ten, then we just need to add up something that is uh, add this mu times i, so that the mu is bigger than ten. Say mu I can set it to fifteen or or twelve, something bigger than ten. Then when I add negative ten, and uh, uh, some number bigger than 10, then we know that the sum of these two will be positive. The sum of these two is positive, and the sum of the other corresponding ones will be also positive, because all the others are even bigger than this. So we will sum up the number in the, to make this thing just totally positive. Okay, so that's the idea here. All right, so it's, my point is that, that we can uh, choose this mu uh, sufficiently large, so that the uh, lambda i plus mu will be positive for all the eigenvalues. So in this case, I can add this mu i to the h, so that the mu i, the h is this, uh, where we have the lambda in the middle, and uh, mu i here can be written as something similar with the, this in the middle. So when I add this two, I will just uh, pull, uh, pull out this mu, uh, u transpose and u on the two sides, and uh, I can put this in the middle, right? And this in the middle is just the I diagonal matrix with this plus this as the diagonal. And since we said we chose this mu large enough so to make this one a positive uh, diagonal matrix, then we know that this matrix will be positive definite. Okay, so here, if this mu, if this matrix H is not positive definite, then uh, what we said here is that you can add this mu i for for a possible for a mu large enough so that this thing becomes positive definite. Okay, so this is the one way to uh, overcome this issue. Although it's not, but the issue is that it's not exactly Newton's method anymore, uh, since Newton's method use, is using this. So what we did here is called Levenberg and Marquardt uh, uh, modification. Of the Newton's method, uh, so that is very simple. The idea is as simple as we just said. You just add, if this is not a positive definite, you just add this by a multiple of identity matrix for this mu k sufficiently large, uh, so that this can be a positive definite matrix. And then instead of using H k inverse G k uh, as the distance direction, we use this inverse times G k as the distance direction. Okay. So in this case, uh, this will be the D k. And uh, then choose, and you can choose the step size R of K so that uh, this becomes a decent method. And that is not an issue anymore because this, since this matrix is already positive definite, as we showed before, uh, this must this negative of this thing here must be a decent direction. So we must be able to choose some positive step size R of K so that the f of xk plus one is less than or equal to f of xk. So it makes this method decent decent method. Okay, um, so let's consider uh, a also general K 
case for to apply Newton's method for a, a nonlinear uh, least squares. So um, this is a more general problem than the quadratic function. The quadratic function is really probably the most basic uh, optimization problem to solve. Uh, but generally, we may have something that, more comp that are more complicated. For example, the nonlinear least least squares is a problem given by this. So the objective function here it can be written as a sum of squared of this uh, ri's. Okay, so basically we have uh, m of these functions. Each of them is a mapping from R n to R. And uh, the objective function is the square sum of them, or sum of squares of them. Okay, uh, so R1 is R n to R, R2 is R n to R. There are m of them. So I can resemble them together, put them together, and then it becomes my vector Rx. So this Rx is a vector valued function. It maps any n dimensional vector x to an m dimensional vector. Okay, and this is uh, the the uh, fx is just uh, the Rx norm squared. Okay, it's actually just this. Okay, I can write it in this way as well. But the inventory f itself is a uh, scalar valued function. So in this case, um, we can consider we're going to use the Jacobian of this um, like this function r. So what it means that when you recall, I have this function r, which is a rec valued. Okay. So as the extension to uh, this scalar valued function. Remember that for scalar valued function, uh, when we take we can say we can say about talk about the gradient. And uh, remember the gradient will be a m dimensional vector. So a easy way to check the dimension of this gradient f is to see how uh, what is the dimension of uh, n here and there was a dimension here. So dimension here automatically is just a one. So uh, a trick here is that. The gradient f should be a one times one by n dimensional vector, or one should be of size one by n. Okay, and this is indeed the case. Uh, if we stack all the partial derivatives, formally, I should have this vector, and that is a one by n uh, vector or one by n matrix. Okay, so if you have R. Uh, as mapping from Rn to Rm, then the gradient of R, actually we should call the Jacobi of R, should be, you know, for each component, R1, starting from R1, I need to take the gradient. So the first row is actually just the gradient of R1. Okay, this will be the row, the n-dimensional vector. Uh, so you treat R1 as this f, or take this f as r1, then you should get the gradient, and that, that will be the first row of the Jacobian. And then you take the second uh, the second component r2, and then you also take the gradient, and you get a row vector. And eventually you get a gradient rm. Okay, so what this matrix actually is, is dr1, dx1, dr2, oh, sorry, dr1, dx, dx2, all the way to dr1 dxn, okay, and uh, all the way to last row, which is drm dr dx1, all the way to drm dxn. So this one is of size m by n because it has m rows and uh, n columns. Okay, so this is how we got the size for the Jacobian. The Jacobian should be. As we said here, if it's uh, Rn to R1, then the size of this is 1 by n. And if it's Rn to Rm, then the size of this should be m by n. So this should be the size here. Okay, And this, in this particular case, we call the Jacobian uh, instead of the gradient. Okay, So that's the Jacobian here. This is exactly the Jacobian here. And this is the, the same thing as I just said.
So it's n, n by n dimensional. Uh, it's a matrix of size n by n. Okay. Now uh, let's take a look at the original function. The function, as we said, can be written as the square uh, norm of Rx. So remember, this is the m dimensional m dimensional vector. Okay, so the square norm of Rm, and then we can try to take the gradient of this. So it's taking the gradient. You can think of this pretty much like the uh, univariate case, uh, the scalar value case. So we take a gradient of the square. What you get is two times Rx times gradient rx, right? It should be like this. But right now the rx is the vector. So what I should get is, um, what I actually should get is two times rx times the gradient of rx. But remember the gradient of rx actually means the Jacobian. So remember that uh, this is of size, um, This should be of size of 1 by m. Uh, should take transpose of that. So 1 by m. Okay. And uh, this part, so the, including the, the transpose, should be 1, one by m. And here, this one, as we, as we said, is m by n. Okay. Then the whole thing together should be 1 by n. Okay, oh, sorry, I should the gradient f. Gradient f should be this. Okay, so it's one by n. Uh, the reason why I write this way, which is the transpose of, so remember this thing here, it's just equal to the gx. So the reason why I write it in the transpose way here is because usually we, uh, in optimization, a standard way is to treat the vectors as column vectors. Okay, uh, it's just some kind of habit. Not necessary to be this. Then depends on the depending depending on the author or any on the. But in most of the cases, we we think uh, the vectors as a ve column vector. So in this case, uh, we the actual gradient of f is actually uh, the transpose of this whole thing. But the transpose of this will be just uh, so if you use the transpose, then two doesn't change. The J Jacobian of x, I should take the transpose of that, and then we should have our x. So in this case, uh, the, the Jacobian itself is m by n. So when I take the transpose of it, it becomes n by m. And this rx is the m by 1 column vector we said earlier. So that's why the whole thing here is still m by 1. That's a column vector. But it's the same, exactly the same vector. I just put it as a column shape. Okay, so you have this. And uh, you can also take the second order Delta was the Haitian of the function f. That means you need to take the gradient one more time. Uh, so take the gradient of this whole thing one more time. And it's the same as taking the gradient of this whole thing. So the two doesn't matter. And I take the gradient of this inside. And I actually use the product rule, right? So I have this, I take the gradient on this rx first. So let me take the gradient of the Haitian, uh, of the gradient ff. And that means I take the gradient of this 2jx transpose rx, and this becomes 2 times, if I take, apply the, uh, the product rule, I should have jx transpose gradient rx, plus, this is the, the gradient is applied to the rx, and then I need to take the gradient of the first one, which is jx. So it's like I take the gradient of the jx, transpose rx. Okay, so that's what happens. And remember that this one is just jx itself. So here, that's why we have this term. So just jx times, transpose times jx. And uh, recall the size. This jx is size of m by, uh, uh, m by n. So the transpose of this should be m by n. And also this jx is m by n. So the two things together will be m by n. That's reasonable, right? Because we said that this is the Haitian of this function f of x. The f is a mapping from Rn to R. So the Haitian, the gradient of f should be uh, a n-dimensional vector, and uh, the Haitian of f should be 
a n by n matrix. So now we have the first n by n matrix. That's this. And then this is also n by n matrix. Let's figure out what that is. So this one actually is read it out. Um, we we'll apply the G of this one more time. Okay, so what this actually means is um, remember that the J itself is already a matrix. When I take the gradient, it's like I'm taking gradient along uh, each of the components. So I'm taking gradient of the Jacobian here and then the Rx. The Jacobian here is the, what the, as I said, the first row is gradient of R1. Second row is gradient of R2, right? And all the way to gradient Rm. That, and remember that I'm going to take the gradient one more time. It's like I get the Haitian of R1, Haitian of R2, all the way to Haitian of Rm. Okay, so keep in mind that this what this one, this matrix is. Uh, Remember that my J is like a J is a Jacobian, right? So it will map every point to a matrix. So every n-dimensional vector to a matrix which is n by n. So when I take the gradient of J one more time, this should be a size of remember m by n by n. So that should be the size of this matrix. Okay, so it should be m by n by n. And I have this r here. This r is m by one. So when I take a tr so the first matrix here gives me m by n by n. But I when I take a transpose, When I take a transpose, this whole thing becomes n by n by m. Okay, it's a three-dimensional matrix. I take a transpose, and this one is m by one. So uh, after I multiply together, it should be n by n by one. But that one dimension is is you know is single, is single term. So its whole thing is just uh, do n by n. So that's what this part is. And then when you really write it out, you realize that this m has to match this m dimension thing should match this m rows here. So it's like I'm multiplying r1 to this first row, r2 to the second row, all the way to rm, because this r has m components. Right? This, m, this r here is r1, r2, all the way to rm. rm. So this should be just multiplied to each of those, comp each of those uh, uh, components. So that's why this is just the R1 times the Haitian of R1, R2 times the Haitian of R2, all the way sum to Rm times the Haitian of Rm. So that's how we got this. Okay, that's the SH. Okay, so now this is the n by n matrix, this is the n by n matrix, and the sum of them is still n by n matrix. And now this is the the this is actually the Haitian of F. So if we apply the Newton's method. And this is the x plus one xk minus the Haitian uh, inverse, which is this, and then the gradient of f, which is this. Okay, so I have this two uh, and also this two here. But since I'm taking the inverse of this, it becomes one half times the inverse of this, and that one half uh, came from this two here is cancelled with that two. So that's why in this one here we don't have any. Uh, Two uh, left. Okay, so that's this is the the Newton's method when we apply uh, when we apply to the uh, nonlinear least squares. Okay, the reason we call by the way the reason we call it nonlinear least squares is this r may be a nonlinear function, and the least squares means that we this we're taking the sum of squared r's. And we want to find the x that can minimize this sum of squares. So that's why we call the least squares. 
make nonlinear leaves with squares. So this one also has a lot of many of the real world problems can be written in this way for some R. Okay, um, so the computation of this could be a little bit uh, complicated, right? Because we have so many things to compute. Uh, in practice, uh, one can you know ignore this term because this term involves the Haitian, and then uh, presumably this should be it should be a a should be dominated by this term or should be a smaller term than compared to the J transpose J. So that's why. Uh, in practical computations, people may just ignore the second order term and leave this uh, alone. Just use this and take the inverse. Okay, uh, this is called the Gauss Newton's method. Uh, if it works, it's, uh, it's supposed to work really fast. Uh, but the problem is that if you just do this, this matrix may not be invertible. And that's uh, where we can also apply the, the old trick we just studied. And we can add up. A, some positive uh, multiple of a uh, identity matrix to make this one positive definite. So just uh, put some mu k large enough so that this one becomes positive definite. So that is invertible. And not only that, we know if it is uh, it's positive not definite matrix, then the the thing here gives us a decent direction as well. Okay. So this is a modification of the Newton's method. Okay, next we <coughs> consider a more advanced method for solving optimization methods, uh, optimization problems. So the method is called conjugate gradient. Okay, so let's first see the motivation of conjugate gradient method. Uh, recall that we know the gradient method uh, or gradient descent method can be applied to uh, general smooth optimization problems. But uh, the issue with that is the convergence is really slow. Okay, so what do I mean by that is when we have a quadratic function, for example, the simplest one that we see, when we have this quadratic function written as the standard form, then the convergence is affected by the condition number of this Q. Uh, recall that the condition number of Q, uh, we use the notation kappa, to denote the condition number, and that is the maximum condition uh, eigenvalue of Q divided by the minimum eigenvalue of Q. If this number is really large, then the convergence rate is recall that we have this result. The value of x or v of x uh, evaluates the the square Q norm of x to the x star. So the smaller this value is, the better the, or the closer the solution is, uh, the, the result is to the true solution. Okay? And we have this general result, which is this. So this means that uh, when we start from initial gas x0 and you apply gradient descent method, then for each iter after each iteration, the value of this v is shrinked by 1 minus kappa. But when this, uh, sorry, one minus one over kappa. Okay, so when this kappa is really large, the one over kappa is really small, and the one minus this quantity will be very small, uh, will, will be very large. So for example, if kappa is a thousand, then this is this number is uh, point zero point nine nine nine. Okay, so it's a really large number. And that means the shrink every time we only shrink a little bit. So what that actually means is that suppose we have a 2D case, then I draw the level set of this function. So what I mean by that is what I, is what I uh, we discussed earlier. Say I have a two-dimensional problem. The Q is just x is just x1, x2. Just have two. Uh, just has two components. Q is a two by two matrix, and uh, then this x one x two uh, spans the plane of this x, right? So domain of x, and the the, the function value is the third direction is popping out of the screen, and the the um, this function f is like a surface floating uh, on the above the screen, 
and uh, there's a ball that's facing you, but this ball is very narrow. Uh, it's like a very narrow alley or a uh, very narrow envelope uh, with opening facing you. And then, um, if it is very narrow, then when we have started with some initial x0, the gradient descent method asks us to do the to go for the negative gradient direction each time. So the negative gradient is proportional to uh, the level set because on the level set here, on this level set, the function f is constant. Okay, uh, so the this perpendicular direction gives the fastest increase, uh, fastest decrease. So let's say uh, you have a, this kind of a ball, and uh, the center is at the middle. It's the ball. It's the closest to the screen, furthest, uh, furthest from you, and this ball is facing you. So this is like the bottom of the of the ball, and uh, so this direction. So from every point, so it's like this is the this is the minimum value, and then this is the higher value, and this is even higher values. Okay, so the further from the center, the further value is. The larger the value is, so if you go this direction, that's the fastest increase of the function value. If you go this direction, that will be the fastest decrease of the function value. And this direction is actually the negative gradient direction. And the gradient direct descent method asks us to do this direction. And now when we if we do this, the next iteration will reach to some point, say here. And uh, after we reach here, there will be x1. And now we'll go gradient descent direction. Uh, negative gradient direction again, and the negative gradient direction should be perpendicular to the level set. So that will be this direction. It's basically almost the same direction going back, but slightly uh, tilted to the center, to the minimum value. Okay, but it's perpendicular to this level set. And then we add reach x2. So you see, this is a very simple problem, just two dimensional problem. And we need to go this like zigzag shape. And you can imagine that we are going this way. So it takes lots of further iterations to get to the minimum value. Okay, for each zigzag, uh, for each uh, line segment, it would take the one iteration. Okay, so this is very inefficient. But in comparison, we studied the Newton's method, and that is a very promising method in the sense that uh, if we're working on or dealing with a quadratic function, then the uh, Newton's method will give will get us. Get us to the minimum value within just one iteration. Okay, so it says that we start from here, then just one iteration will be there. Okay, but the the uh, the um, the cost that we we have to pay is uh, is that we need to solve that system q x equals to b. But solving the system itself is not easy. It could take uh, lots of computational time, uh, lots of computations. So that is only theoretically, it, it looks really nice. It has a, a very fast convergence. Uh, for a quadratic function, it's just one step. For other types of, of problems, it has a local uh, quadratic convergence rate. But in practice, it's rather, rarely used. The, re it's, the reason is because of the, the expensive uh, computation for each step, since we need to do the inverse of the Hessian. OK. So here, uh, we people develop an, another method called this conjugate gradient method. And the idea here is that the motivation here is that we can try to still use the gradient method because gradient is easy to do. Gradient method just need to compute the gradient. For example, in this quadratic case, if the function is a quadratic function, the gradient is just qx minus b. Right? We know that the gradient of f at any x is just qx minus b. Computing this is easy because for a given matrix, for a given vector, uh, for a given x, for a given matrix and, Q, uh, uh, and the Q and B, computing this is really straightforward. Right? Which is matrix vector multiplication, then taking the difference of the two vectors. This is really cheap to compute. Okay, um, so the question is, can we, or the 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 motivation is, can we just uh, use the gradient? Um, Rather than the Newton's method, which requires like solving this kind of thing, or in general, remember that we need to do the xk plus one equals to xk minus 
the Haitian, we used the H before, but the, the HK is just this. We need to compute the inverse of the Haitian times this XK. Okay, so the question is, can we avoid doing this, doing the inverse of this matrix? Uh, actually, you, you, if, you had, if uh, you've never tried before, uh, have never have this sense, actually computing this inverse is super expensive. Um, the computational cost is, say I have a matrix A, uh, the size is n by n. Then computing the inverse of this matrix is approximately computation, computational color or computational complexity is roughly this. So the idea is that you can try it on your uh, on your laptop. Um, if you, you either use the MATLAB or using your use Python, you can try to generate some random matrix. Say you can generate this random matrix using this notation. If you're using MATLAB, you just generate a random matrix. So I should say um, you can generate your A to be say 5,000 by 5,000 will be fine, for example. So this is what the notation you can use in MATLAB. Or you can use Python, something similar in Python, use the NumPy package. So this gives you a random matrix uh, of 5,000 by 5,000. And uh, the components or entries of this matrix are randomly drawn from 0 to 1. Okay? And you can try to inverse this. I think you might, in MATLAB, you can compute inverse of A. Okay, you can see how long it takes. Okay, uh, I think uh, it should be, shouldn't be less than 10 seconds. Okay, uh, or it could be longer, it depends on your laptop. But this is a really small size. Okay, in practice, uh, we may consider uh, matrix of size millions of millions. Okay, so what that means is this N right now is Let's consider n, and let's consider the time. Say if you do this n for 5,000, and the time takes you 10 seconds. And now you try to make this matrix size 100 times larger. 100 times larger. So that will be right, 50, uh, 500,000. Okay, and then your n has a size uh, increased by 100, but your n cube, the computational cost is proportional to the n cube. So this time should be uh, from there to there, you get from n to 100n. And then you compute the n cube, it will be 10 to the 6 times n cube, right? So if your n increases the size by 100, then your uh, n cube will increase. The value will be scaled by a million. And you can compute that. In this case, you have 10 to the million. Uh, you have a, a million times 10 seconds. You can try how long this, this one will take. Okay, so don't wait uh, for the computer to finish. We'll put it in this because it will take forever to finish. Uh, so that's why the no one really wants to compute this in practice. And that's why we try to uh, avoid doing this, but just to directly uh, work on the gradient. So that's the motivation for gradient, uh, contrary gradient method. Uh, it was developed roughly in, I think, in, in 50s or 60s, so uh, more than half a century ago. And, uh, but this is still the state of the art. Even today, okay, and that's become this is because of the efficiency that of this method, and don't think that this is same step you only working for, like quadratic functions. First of all, it doesn't only apply to quadratic functions; it can be applied to general optimization method. But the convergence is the the convergence readout is more uh, mature or is very well studied 
for quadratic functions. And uh, although it's very special type, but in practice, lots of new scientific computing problems can be converted into a quadratic can be converted into minimizing a quadratic function. A very typical example is most of the case people just try to solve this kind of system. Uh, let me use different notations. Uh, say ax equals to let's say x to the a. Okay. So in most of the cases that people are given were given the matrix A and then the vector A. And we so this is n by n, this is n by one, and then we try to figure out this vector here, which is n by one vector. And a common way to do this is to convert this into minimizing, finding the minimizer of this objective function. But this objective function here is actually a quadratic function. You can expand this, you will realize this is just a one half x transpose a transpose x. Uh, a transpose ax plus or uh, minus uh, a transpose little a transpose x plus one half the norm of a squared. Okay, so this is actually a quadratic function because you can treat this as the q, you treat this as the b, and this is a constant, so it. So it doesn't really matter when you minimize this, right? It doesn't affect your minimizer. And this is a perfect uh, quadratic min quadratic uh, function here. And the solving this, solving for the minimizer of this is the equivalent to solving for the solving this linear system here. So finding the minimizer of this problem is equivalent to finding the solution of this linear system. And as I said, most of the problems can be the scientific problems can be written uh, in this form, given the matrix A, given the uh, vector A, and try to figure out this. Okay, so that's why it has lots of applications, and uh, this is where the country gradient method uh, can be applied to. And uh, it has great success in the past decades. Okay, so now going back to what we are trying to say, uh, <clears throat> country gradient method is trying to uh, improve the gradient method, so we are trying not trying to do this, zigzags. Instead, we want to uh, change our uh, distant direction, not using the gradient direction, but a so-called conjugate direction, so that we can just uh, reach to the minimum in just a few steps. Okay, so we change the, we tune, uh, tune the direction so that I can get faster convergence just within a few steps. Okay, so to do that, we need to give several definitions. Uh, the first one is the first definition is that uh, <clears throat> for a positive definite matrix Q, so it's like the Q here. So suppose it's positive definite, then we call a set of vectors. This is a set of n-dimensional vectors. We call these vectors Q conjugate. If you pick up any two of them, you pick up any two of them, uh, you take this, say you pick up di and dj from them, and then the di transpose q dj. So remember that this is a row vector, a matrix, and column vector. So you multiply them together, it should be a scalar. Okay? If this di q dj is a zero, for any two vectors you pick out from here, then you can call this uh, uh, q conjugate. So this is pretty much like the, the ortho, uh, orthogonal uh, vectors that we, we, you probably know before. So you have a set of orthogonal vectors. So what that means is if you pick up any two of them, uh, the inner product of the two is zero, right? That is orthogonal, it's a set of orthogonal vector vectors. So this is just a slight generalization of that. Uh, instead of taking direct uh, inner product of di dj, we insert this q in the middle and uh, make sure that this is zero. So this is why uh, we sometimes also call this notation the di q dj or in general, a vector for any given vector x and the y, we denote this x transpose qy as the q inner product. So this notation is divided by the standard inner product with the q subscript. So this means that I will take the x transpose and q and the y. And so a special case is that q equals to identity. If it's identity matrix, then this 
thing here is just x transpose identity y, which is just x transpose y, and that is the standard inner product. But the, with the but the Q inner product would allow this to allow this a definition for general Q, uh, general positive definite matrix matrix Q. Okay, so what we if we know this notation, the Q inner product, then uh, when the Q, the Q when this Q inner product of the two vectors is zero, we say that they are Q conjugate. Okay, basically we say that they are Q conjugate. So there, that means they're orthogonal in the Q sense, in the Q inner product sense. Okay, in the Q uh, inner product sense. So, uh, so the Q conjugate vectors just means that uh, these vectors are uh, orthogonal in the Q inner product sense. Okay, you pick up any two, the inner product, the Q inner product of the two is zero. Okay, and also inner product can give us the definition for uh, for norms, right? Remember that when we have inner product of a vector, this in general you have in general you have the inner product of two vectors given by x1, y1 plus all the way to xn, yn, right? Uh, so if it's just the x with itself, then just be x1 square plus all the way to xn square. Right, so this is just like the Q norm, uh, just like the square norm of X. So if we generalize this into the uh, the the Q norm, Q inner product here, then we will just uh, replace this by the Q inner product. So it would be X Q, X Q. And this is denoted, defined by the Q norm square. Right? This is actually something we've seen uh, in the earlier, in the in the uh, chapter of gradient descent or gradient method. <coughs> okay? And this is nothing but just x transpose Q x, or you can write it as uh, x Q x standard norm of x and Q, standard inner product between x and Q x. Okay, either way, they are the same thing. Okay. Now, um, why we uh, introduce the concept of Q conjugate vectors? The thing is that we're going to use this Q conjugate vector, Q conjugate vectors, as our direction, as your descent direction, instead of the gradient or negative gradient as the descent direction. Okay, we use the negative gradient in the gradient method, but here in conjugate gradient method, we use this. As the as the search direction or as the descent direction, okay. A first property of about these Q conjugate vectors are if you have if you have a Q, uh, n by n mm, uh, positive definite matrix, then uh, as long as we have less than n less than n uh, less than or equal to n Q conjugate vectors. They must be linear independent. Uh, actually, we cannot have more than n Q conjugate vectors. It's like in the n-dimensional space, we cannot have more than n linearly independent vectors. Okay, this is the same same thing uh, here. <coughs> so for n by n positive definite matrix Q, uh, we can have at most n Q conjugate vectors, and uh, <coughs> the reason is uh, as long as we have these vectors. That are Q conjugate, they must be linear independent. Okay, so now we have Q0, Q1 up to QK, where K is less than or equal to n minus one. That means in total, I have at most n of these vectors that are Q conjugate. Then we can show that these vectors must be linear independent. Okay, that is why I said that we cannot have more than n uh, Q conjugate vectors because we don't have n, more than n linear independent vectors in n-dimensional space. Okay, so how do we show this? Actually, proving this is pretty easy. If we want to show a set of vectors that are linear independent, what we should do is we take a linear combination of them. Let's say that the linear combination of them is this form. And if we can show that the only way to make this linear combination equal to zero is to have all of those co coefficients as zero. Okay? And by this, we can show these vectors are linear independent. Well, how do we show that? How do we show that? So now let's say that I have this vector, 
alpha 0, d0. So alpha 0 is a scalar, d0 is a vector. dk. So I know that if I like, I should write, write this uh, notation means that it's a vector. OK, I can multiply this vector by, uh, say, for example, q0 transpose q. So I multiply both sides by q0 transpose q. So this is a row vector here. This is a, this is a, a square matrix. And uh, here, every one of them is a column vector, right? These are all column vectors. You eventually get a column vector. So I multiply this row vector, this thing to the left of this thing. Then on the right, I still have zero. If I multiply this thing to zero, it's still zero. But when I multiply this to this, I should multiply uh, multiply this to each one of them. Okay, and the the constant should be just leave left out because it's just a constant it can move around. So let's say when I multiply this to the first term, what I will get is the alpha zero times d zero. I should use vector here, d zero transpose q d0, right? That's what I have in the first term. When I multiply this thing to the, remove this. When I multiply this to this first term, and then I need to multiply this to the second term, and then all the way to the last term. So, but when I starting from the second term, when I multiply this to that, I'll say I'll have, as I will have d0 transpose qd0, sorry, qd1, because this first term is d1. But since the d's are q conjugate, means that you pick up any two of them, uh, the q inner product of them is equal to 0. So that means q0, d0, q, d1, this inner product should be equal to 0. So that means when I multiply this to the second term, I'll get, just get 0. When I multiply to the later ones, they will just always get 0. So I only have this term left. On the on the left on the left side, and uh, I will also have zero on the on the right hand side. So it should be zero and now because I'm multiplying a vector to this vector, <coughs> so I got a zero scalar. So this gives gives me this. Well, then I have this. Remember that this term is the it's like the q square q norm of d zero. Uh, Apparently, the d, this these cannot be zero vectors, right? It cannot be zero vectors. Otherwise, when you multiply this zero vector to any to q times any other vector, you should get zero. Okay? That doesn't make uh, doesn't uh, it's not meaningful. So all the all these vectors are non-zero. But if it's non-zero and I have a quadratic, uh, sorry, I have a positive definite matrix in the middle, then this thing must be strictly positive. So I have some alpha zero times a strictly positive number I got zero. That just means this alpha zero must be equal to zero. Okay. So this is what happens when I multiply this d zero q to the left of both sides. If I multiply d one q two of them, then I realize that when I multiply d one of this to the first term, I'll get zero. To the second term, I'll get I'll show that alpha one equals zero, and then when I multiply to the others, we can still get zero. Right. So that's how we showed that. Uh, <coughs> what I just showed that is this alpha 0 is 0. But if you continue doing this, you can show all the other alphas are 0. And if you can show that all the alpha are 0, all this alpha will be 0, then that means this, uh, these vectors are linear independent, or these vectors are linear independent. Okay. <coughs>